The White House has enlisted the help of supercomputers to fight COVID-19, including the Frontera supercomputer at your center. What kind of work is your computer actually doing with the White House and more broadly? We have about 25 different projects now that we're supporting um, that I would put in sort of three different categories. And they're from researchers all over the country that have come through this mechanism that the government has put together to get to sort of expedite getting time on our supercomputers. Um, the three categories are sort of things around people and social modeling. So we have some work on uh, tracking social distancing and how people interact and the epidemiology of the virus. You see a lot of that in the media now with the forecasts of how many hospital beds will be required, how much intensive care, et cetera. Um, at the sort of other extreme, we're working at the molecular and atomic level to try and understand the structure of the virus. We have a uh, working with Romeo Morrow, for instance, at UC San Diego, among a number of different research teams that are trying to model the actual structure of the spike and how it moves in the virus molecule itself, which it uses to get into the cell. And then you do various kinds of screening for drugs where you take chemical compounds and try and see if it'll fit on there and keep it from getting in. We have another researcher at UT looking at, can we use copper to coat it to slow the spread? So, uh, and then the third thing is genomics, um, looking at the actual RNA strands in the virus, looking at the DNA of patients who are infected and trying to find common, uh, you know, common strands with other, other viruses where we have effective treatments to we can translate things. So what is it that a supercomputer is capable of that a regular computer can't do? Is it that you can do these things so much faster than a regular computer? Is it the teamwork between supercomputers around the world? Yeah, fundamentally it's size and speed when it comes to the supercomputer itself. Um, we, we sort of class it into things that are capability. We can just solve a bigger problem that wouldn't fit in a normal computer. That structural simulation, we're doing 200 million atoms at once. Um, so you need a massive amount of memory and it just, you know, your regular computer couldn't do it. Other things like the epidemiology models, we're just running tens of thousands of them at once. Um, so it's a matter of just sort of the volume and the throughput. Um, and most of these things are on one supercomputer. I would say the relationships piece isn't between the supercomputers, it's between the researchers in the life sciences who are doing some of this work and people in computation who know how to help them optimize their software and speed it up. Um, for the collaborations we got going first are people that we've worked with for years and sort of know how they operate and they know how we operate. And having those sort of pre-existing relationships has really helped us get going quickly. What about in other places like the US, Spain, Italy, where anecdotally we're hearing that there are probably perhaps hundreds of people dying at home who aren't getting included in the reported numbers and may never even be tested because, because tests are so scarce. Yeah, I think, you know, one thing that makes the modeling a lot harder is we have really incomplete data because we don't have, you know, we're mostly testing people who are sick. Um, and we're not sort of doing a random sampling of the population to get a baseline of data to see how the concentration of the virus changes. Um, and that certainly makes it a lot uh, more intractable problem. You know, our models are only as good as the data that feeds into them um, in many of these cases, particularly the epidemiology ones, right? The molecular ones, that structure of atoms and molecules, that's pretty well understood. But these things that involve people, we need good data and it's hard to get it with the level of testing we have right now. So in your view, uh, can these computers work fast enough to get us the things that we need now, essentially? Or is even uh, you know, having the benefit of these supercomputers just, just not enough to get treatments, vaccines, get a handle on, on, on where this is spreading and how fast um, uh, now, essentially? So uh, in the end, I think computing is not going to be our bottleneck. We can run these things pretty fast. There are uh, many, many different chemical compounds we might want to try. Um, and really what the computers do is help um, reduce the number of things we need to try in the lab. But ultimately for vaccines, for instance, we're sort of upstream of what the medicine, medical chemists do. All we can do is say of the 10 to the 60th possible chemical compounds in the universe, um, here's a very large set that we know won't work. Here's maybe a few dozen candidates to try, but it's still going to have to go through the clinical trials, and that's where the time is going to, a lot of time will still be taken. Now, supercomputers are one thing, but also there's quantum computing, which as I understand it is even faster than supercomputing, and quantum computing is also being used uh, to fight COVID-19. How does that compare um, in, 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 in terms of what that can deliver and, and how quickly? Yeah, so quantum computing, it's not something we're using in-house yet. It's something we simulate um, a fair amount, but uh, it's really a different model of computing, and it doesn't really solve at least the state of the machines today. 
Um, they don't solve the same kinds of problems, but there's certain kinds of optimization problems where they are remarkably fast, you know, orders of magnitude faster than a conventional computer, even a conventional large supercomputer, or they at least have the potential to be. So, um, you know, there are pieces of the story where we can plug in quantum devices and get some acceleration. Uh, but for things, again, the structural modeling we're doing right now, the protein docking, that's probably not a quantum problem. Um, we have high hopes that they might be useful in sort of using some AI methods to accelerate the drug screening. Now, you're running simulations and modeling all day long. I'm curious, what are you finding most surprising, or is there one thing in particular that uh, the results show that made you say, huh, wouldn't have thought about it that way? So, uh, you know, m mostly I'm trying to keep millions of these simulations running every day for a whole bunch of people, and I haven't uh, sort of dove deeply into the data for uh, what a lot of people are doing, but I know we've gotten some of the researchers we work with have come up with some pretty interesting structural insights into just the, particularly into how these spikes form and how tall they are and how they move that I think will be awfully helpful in us coming up with better therapeutics down the line.